in our discussion of cardiovascular infections, perhaps the most important is that of infective endocarditis. It's defined as an infection of the endothelial surface of the heart, and that's usually heart valves, but if you think about it, if you have a persistent infection anywhere in the vasculature, it could produce something similar to infective endocarditis. Occasionally, it's from a damaged endocardial surface. There have been cases of endocarditis following an acute myocardial infarction where the vegetations are found on the damaged heart muscle. Many patients nowadays have pacemakers in, and so you can get an infection related to a pacemaker wire that sheds organisms into the bloodstream and causes something very similar to a valvular infection. It's worthwhile to give an overview of the history of infective endocarditis because it has changed in the era of modern medicine. Back in the 1920s, the mean age of a person getting infective endocarditis was less than 30 years. And this reflects congenital heart disease and rheumatic fever. It had moved up to about 40 years of age in the 1940s. But in the present era, the mean age of a person getting infection of their heart valve is over 50 years of age. Males outnumber females two to one. It's an infection that's uncommon in children, thank goodness, uh, unless they have you know, some septal defect repaired related to congenital heart disease. Now, infants can get infected endocarditis because now small babies are kept alive where in the past they weren't able to be kept alive and they have lots of catheters for venous and arterial access put in these little babies. And so they can get endocarditis. The predisposing conditions between 1938 and 67 were primarily valvular heart disease, that is congenital heart disease, and rheumatic heart disease accounted for about 40% of the damaged valves leading to infective endocarditis. It's important to point out that this still is a very common predisposing factor in developing countries. Patients who've had endocarditis in the past are particularly predisposed to get it again. And non-cardiac underlying disease was seen then in IV drug users, in diabetics, and in patients with urological infections, usually those going, undergoing instrumentation. But the predisposing conditions in the 2000s are still valvular heart disease, congenital. But now, instead of rheumatic heart disease, we're talking about degenerative valve disease. People are living longer, long enough for their valves to degenerate. Uh, and that includes the mitral and aortic valves. A condition that wasn't easily recognized until the era of echocardiography was that of mitral valve prolapse. Now mitral valve prolapse with regurgitation, in other words, the mitral valve not only prolapses into the left atrium, but leaks blood through it. They have a three to eight fold increased risk of endocarditis. So this is one of the leading problems in the heart that predispose to endocarditis. But mitral valve prolapse without regurgitation, that risk is about the same as the general population. And uh, unless you're 
examining the heart carefully, you may miss somebody who has mitral valve prolapse with regurgitation. Mitral valve prolapse with regurgitation may be preceded by a click and then a mid-systolic murmur that is more ejection in quality. Simple mitral valve prolapse would be often heard as a mid-systolic click. But rheumatic heart disease is not out of the picture. It still accounts for about 3% of the predisposing conditions. And look how much prosthetic valves have increased as a cause of infective endocarditis. About 20% of the cases of endocarditis occur in patients with prosthetic valves. And now we're doing more things. We are putting endocardial devices in like pacemakers, implantable cardiac defibrillators, and since those have access to the heart through wires, we are now having those wires get infected and they are leaning up against valves and the endocardium and so endocarditis can occur. In terms of non-cardiac underlying disease, IV drug use is still quite prevalent as is chronic IV access. As we treat serious disease and maintain IVs in patients, we're keeping them alive longer, long enough to get infections of these intravenous devices. As I mentioned, degenerative valve lesions are associated with just the longer survival of the population. There's another interesting reason for an increase in endocarditis, and that is because based on the 2007-2008 guidelines for preventing endocarditis, we're not using antibiotics as much. It used to be if somebody had any kind of history of almost any kind of heart disease and they went to the dentist, the dentist would prescribe an antibiotic. We were giving antibiotics essentially willy-nilly for any mention of heart disease. Well, based on those guidelines uh, being changed, we no longer give antibiotics for all those indications anymore. And so naturally, you've seen a minimal uh, to moderate rise in the incidence of infective endocarditis. In other words, we were abusing antibiotics and that kept endocarditis down but when we stopped abusing antibiotics, it's gonna rise slightly. And we're putting prosthetic heart valves in people much more commonly. Congenital heart disease also is slightly on the increase because women are waiting longer to become pregnant. And with that comes an increased incidence of congenital heart disease. And furthermore, lots of medications are now being used during pregnancy, and the effect of those is not essentially clear, but may have something to do with congenital heart disease. And so it's advances in medicine and surgery that have sparked some of the increase in infective endocarditis, pacemakers, defibrillators, dialysis, catheters, you name it. And look at the incidence of IV drug use in North America. From the 1960s to the 2000s, uh, the, there's been an increase in staphylococcal endocarditis from about 25% to 52%, reflecting the use of illicit drugs. The other reason that endocarditis seems to be on the rise is because we are now better able to diagnose it than we were say back in the 60s. We had essentially blood cultures only to diagnose infective endocarditis then. Well, let's turn now to the pathogenesis and see if we can enlighten you on how endocarditis develops in the first place. Abnormal valves produce turbulent blood flow. And turbulent blood flow 
causes the injury of the endothelium. And of course, the endothelium can be further injured by electrodes that are placed in the heart or vascular catheters. And along with intravenous drug use comes the injection of solid particles that are part of what the dr drugs are adulterated with. And then of course, chronic inflammation from rheumatic heart disease or degenerative valve lesions also produces damaged valves with turbulence. So you've got turbulent blood flow and that is one of the keys to endocarditis. So if the endothelium becomes damaged by turbulent blood flow, and if there's a bug that happens to be circulating at the time of the damaged endothelium, and if that bug is able to stick, it will likely stick there. So you have to have circulating bacteria at the same time that you have damaged endothelium. So, in summary, you've got an abnormal valve that leads to a turbulent flow of blood. The turbulent jet of blood damages the endocardium. And what does the body try to do? With any damaged surface, platelets are going to adhere to that damaged surface in order to try to heal that damaged surface. And platelets will stick to one another and you get a clump of platelets and fibrin on that damaged endothelium. And that's what we call non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. It's, there's a vegetation there on the valve, but there's no bug in it. Now, if you have microbes in the bloodstream at the same time, especially those that can adhere to platelets and fibrin, you've got yourself infective endocarditis. It's no longer non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis, it's bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. And here you can see a large friable vegetation on the mitral valve. So we call a vegetation all those little excrescences on the, mitral on the mitral or aortic or whatever valve. That's called a vegetation. Here are some examples of vegetation. One on the aortic valve, a, na a native aortic valve, and a prosthetic valve. So let's then talk about bugs that are loaded for bear and are able easily to cause endocarditis. And foremost among these are the alpha strep and some of the common ones are strep mutans, strep mitior, and strep sanguinis. Actually, there are now several groups of mutans strep and so there's probably not just a single organism anymore known as strep mutans, is probably the mutans streptococci. Well, many of these organis organisms produce dextran. And dextran is a complex extracellular polysaccharide that's produced by some of these strep that cause endocarditis. And it allows organisms to adhere to inert surfaces, like teeth, for example. And of course, if they get into the bloodstream and find damaged endothelium, that non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis, they can stick there too. Some of these alpha strep have FIM-A, which is a 36 kilodalton protein located at the tips of the organisms, right at their Fimbriae, and that mediates attachment to this platelet fibrin matrix. So you can see that those organisms are well suited to stick to non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis.
Streptococcus bovis is notorious because when you have bacteremia or endocarditis due to that organism, just doctor to doctor, you should ask yourself the question, does the patient have colon cancer? If I had a patient who had strep bovis infective endocarditis or even bacteremia, I would probably schedule that patient for a colonoscopy. That's the association. It's not all that common, but you would feel horrible if you missed it. So how do you get all the bugs in the bloodstream? Well, that would be from trauma or damage to a mucosal surface that's heavily colonized by those bugs. And the classic would be the oro and nasopharynx loaded with those alpha streptococci. So is the GI tract. And the GU tract is not loaded with those bugs, but uh, as men age and develop benign prostatic hypertrophy, they are prone to getting infections not only due to things like E. coli, but due to the enterococcus. The enterococcus probably causes about 10% of urinary tract infections uh, and maybe a little more in men with prostate problems. And so if those men were to get instrumented to say have a, a partial prostatectomy and they had enterococcus in the urine at that time, enterococcus is one of the worst organisms to cause endocarditis. And that's because it's very difficult to treat. And it certainly is a common player in this process. So the number of bacteria per ml that get into blood depends upon the trauma of the procedure and the number of the organisms on the surface. One thing that has been recently discovered in the last 15 years is that the risk of getting bugs in the bloodstream just from your daily activities is far greater than that for most dental procedures. So for example, if you were to have your teeth cleaned, you would very likely get bugs in the bloodstream. Most people do when they get their teeth cleaned. If you were to have a dental extraction, almost everybody gets bacteria in the bloodstream from just getting a tooth pulled. Well, that takes about 30 minutes. Then the bacteremia goes away. But what about the daily activities such as brushing your teeth, flossing your teeth, each of those activities carries with it at least a small to moderate risk of bugs in the bloodstream. And we're doing that at least once and twice and maybe more than that in some individuals. And so we're doing that on a daily basis. So I think you can see that just the daily activities have a lot more opportunities for bugs to get into the bloodstream. And when those data were recognized in studies, that led to the changing of the recommendations about giving antibiotics. We were finding out that the risk of daily activities was actually thousands of times greater than a 30 minute episode following a dental procedure. And those guidelines were changed in an article published by, in circulation in 2007. So let's now talk about the bugs that cause endocarditis in a little more detail. About 80% of endocarditis is due to one of these, streptococci or staphylococci, and are varying proportions depending upon whether it's a native valve or a prosthetic valve, what the source of the infection is. For example, if it follows some kind of dental procedure, then it's more likely to be a streptococcus. On the other hand, 
if it follows uh, the drainage, incision and drainage of a boil, a furuncle, it's more likely to be staph. It also is somewhat dependent on the patient's age and coexisting conditions. Another issue that we have to deal with in infective endocarditis is that of culture negative endocarditis. We know clinically, for example, that the patient has endocarditis, but when we draw blood cultures, they're negative. And that accounts for at least 10% of the cases of infective endocarditis. So what would be the explanation for you to have bugs on your heart valve? They should be flapping in the bloodstream breeze. All blood cultures should be positive virtually, but yet the blood cultures are negative. What would explain that? Well, giving antibiotics before the diagnosis is made. Unfortunately, patients will go to the doctor complaining of fever. And what many physicians do is they treat fever with antibiotics. Not all fever should be treated with antibiotics. And just doctor to doctor, if, if that's all the patient has when they come to see you, then let's find out the cause of the fever rather than shoot antibiotics at it. So that's one explanation for culture negative endocarditis. The other explanation for culture negative endocarditis is the group of fastidious organisms, organisms that don't grow easily in the microbiology lab, some that actually take weeks. And by the way, if you do suspect one of those organisms, you should call the microbiology lab and say, I'm worried about a slow growing organism. Would you hold the blood cultures for the next several weeks. We have a patient that might have endocarditis and it's important because the blood cultures after seven days are, and if they're negative in the routine microbiology labs are discarded and called negative. So examples of these would be Bartonella, Brucella, uh, actually a zoonosis. So it's very important to take a history uh, about what the occupation of the patient is. If it's somebody who works in an abattoir, I bet you don't know what an abattoir is. An abattoir is a slaughterhouse. And those people who work there are prone to picking up brucella infections. Coxiella burnetti is a cause of Q fever. Chlamydophilus cytosy, the cause of psittacosis. These are intracellular organisms that are very difficult to grow and difficult to demonstrate. Then there's the Hasek group of organisms. These are a group of gram-negative pleomorphic coccobacilli that are fastidious in their growth, and they include Haemophilus species. There's one actually that's got the name Haemophilus aphrophilus. I absolutely love that name. Uh, then there's aggregated bacteria, formerly called actinobacillus. In fact, its former name was actinobacillus actinomycetum comitans. <laughs> that's why I went into infectious diseases. Then there's cardiobacter for the C, Iconella corrodens, and Kingella species. And we've discovered in the last 30 years that Whipple's disease is actually an infectious disease and Trophorema whippoli can on rare occasions cause infective endocarditis. Don't ask me if I've ever seen a patient with Trophorema whippoli endocarditis, but I'm waiting. Let's turn now to the classification. We used to classify infective endocarditis as either acute endocarditis or subacute, and sometimes even chronic. But those terms are really outmoded. We now classify them 
as either native valve endocarditis, which accounts for about 78%. And among the native valve endocarditis, we include community acquired and healthcare associated, either nosocomial that developed in the hospital or non-nosocomial that is a patient who's a frequent flyer to the hospital, say a dialysis patient. And then there's another form of native valve endocarditis called that due to IV drug use. And you can see the percentages. Also, we talk about pacemaker and defibrillator related endocarditis of native valves. Then we turn to the other classification, which is prosthetic valve endocarditis, and this includes early, less than two months, midterm, two to 12 months, and late, greater than 12 months. Well, why do we classify them like that, early, midterm, and late? Well, as you might expect, if somebody develops infection on a prosthetic heart valve shortly after surgery, it's very likely due to the organisms that were either in the hospital at the time the surgery was done before the wound healed, or from skin bugs that fell into the healing wound, into the open wound or into the healing wound. Midterm still includes some of those organisms, but other organisms begin to creep in and late prosthetic valve endocarditis, think about more than 12 months. You've got the, the endothelium has covered that valve, so it's got a new surface at that point. And so actually late prosthetic valve endocarditis is going to act a lot more like native valve endocarditis. Well, how do patients present when they have endocarditis? You can expect fever in the vast majority. A new murmur is heard in close to half. Now, let's say you have been following your patient who has had a heart murmur and you've known about it. Does that heart murmur change when they have endocarditis? The answer to that is usually not. Sometimes it does get worse, but usually not. So it's still gonna sound mostly like the same old heart murmur. Some patients have microscopic or gross blood in their urine. Many patients with low virulence organisms, it's slow for them to go to the doctor and, and they may have fever for a couple of weeks. Well, this is where the spleen kicks in. The spleen uh, is the recipient of chronic bacteremia and may swell up in response to the bugs that are filtering through. So splenomegaly is common in, in endocarditis due to less virulent organisms. More virulent organisms, on the other hand, produce lesions like this. This would be referred to as a Janeway lesion. And you're gonna find that it's a flat hemorrhagic lesion and this usually results from acute embolization of fragments from these vegetations. And there are living organisms in, the, in these fragments. So these patients are often quite ill. In the old classification, these were the acute endocarditis types. Also in the sicker patients, you may find something called Roth spots. And really what it is is as you look through the ophthalmoscope, you see retinal hemorrhages with a white center. So it's a white infarct of the retina surrounded by an areola of hemorrhage. There are other conditions in which you can find Roth spots. You can find them in profound anemia. You can find them in leukemia. You can find them in certain connective tissue diseases like uh, lupus. Uh, but when you see something like this, you certainly want to think of endocarditis and draw blood cultures. Unfortunately, 
the use of the ophthalmoscope is in decline for reasons that I'm not certain about. When you look at a typical workup, you may see H-E-E-N-T within normal limits, W-N-L. You know, I wonder if sometimes the W-N-L really means we never looked. The emboli can show up also uh, in the conjunctival sac. So in somebody you're working up for endocarditis, all you have to do is pull the eyelid down and you may see these conjunctival hemorrhages. Osler's nodes, named for Sir William Osler, the actual founder of the specialty of internal medicine, wrote a treatise on infective endocarditis. Dr. Osler didn't have any treatment that he could use for endocarditis, but he described it better than most modern people could possibly describe it. And one of the things he found were these painful nodules that develop at the ends of the fingers and toes. So what's happened is you had an emboli, you had emboli going to the fingers and toes from the vegetations, usually due to lower virulence organisms. All right, the body then, the immune system, surrounds these organisms and makes a little tender inflammatory nodule around them. And that's what you call an Osler's node. We'd like to say we find this in virtually every person, but we see this in about 5% of patients. Some other presentations that should get your antenna up are that of sepsis for no apparent reason, congestive heart failure for no apparent reason, a septic pulmonary embolus. Uh, this is common in a couple of situations. One, in IV drug users, and if you think about it, they're shooting things up via their arm veins, and of course, if those are infected things, and contain staph in them, then you will have organisms lodge in the lower lobes of the lungs uh, and produce abscess. And also those organisms gain access to the left side of the heart as well. Or stroke in a young person. What's that all about? Especially if they have fever, you ought to think of endocarditis or acute peripheral artery occlusion, or renal failure. I know of one patient that I saw when I was in my training that was a young man. He had a lot of acne, uh, but he came in with renal failure and he had no fever. And so there was nothing really to suspect uh, endocarditis but we found out that he had renal failure, had never had any predisposing conditions for it. And so on a hunch, blood cultures were drawn and they were positive for coagulase negative staphylococci, several blood cultures. So patients in renal failure may not have the fever that you're expecting uh, and so one of the causes of acute and chronic renal failure actually is infective endocarditis. And as you might expect, these tiny little fragments from these vegetations go everywhere. And they, that includes the brain. So that leads to cerebral complications in 15 to 20% of patients. And they may have an ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke uh, but most of them have not had such a preceding diagnosis. They may have only a transient ischemic attack, and it may be a si totally silent embolism. Furthermore, you can have emboli that go to the vasovasorum of the major blood vessels of the head. The vasovasorum are the blood vessels 
that supply blood vessels. And if you embolized one of those, you would then weaken the wall of the blood vessel that's supplied. And the infection can spread through the vessel wall and give something called a mycotic aneurysm. That term, mycotic, is a misnomer. Mycotic seems to imply this is a fungal uh, aneurysm. Perhaps at one time that's what they were thought to be, but actually uh, these are most likely caused by bacteria. And they also can embolize to the brain and result in a brain abscess or meningitis. <music>